ready? I'm ready. So uh, why don't we start this with the animation, uh, the introduction of the animation, which will introduce what we're talking about. So let's just dive right into it. Hey, hello, let's go. I'm Dr. Mark Allendary, and I'm an infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist. And I'm Doc Griggs, and I'm a community health specialist. Speaking of special, today's podcast is coming live from inside the human body. So, Doc Griggs, does that make it a podcast? <laughs> Dude, don't make me regret sharing my space time hop trick with you. Thanks, TV sitcoms. All right. Hey, ho, let's go. My name is Dr. Mark Alendari. I'm an infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist here in New Orleans. Doc Griggs. And I'm Doc Griggs. I'm a community medicine director at Access Health, Louisiana, also here in New Orleans. And, and, and with <laughs> us is? With, with us is uh, David Rostin. I am also part of the Noise Filter team, one of the producers, and I am broadcasting live, not from the human body, but from Los Angeles, California today. Nice. And it's really a pleasure to be uh, here with all y'all so that we can explain this um, newfound love that the three of us have kind of inadvertently fallen into. We've been uh, very privileged to be asked kind of how the story started. And the story started with Doc Riggs and I, who've been doing radio for years now here on local radio station, WHIV in New Orleans. And uh, Doc Riggs and I are actually pretty funny individually, and together we're actually even funnier. And having two doctors, yeah, it's <laughs> having two doctors talking about medical issues on the radio is actually very amusing and entertaining. And so when the pandemic started, it only seemed naturally appropriate that Doc Riggs and I would just kind of take our once weekly show and turn it into a daily show, uh, which we did, and then also into a daily podcast. And so, uh, Eric, thinking back to those early days before we got to the animations, what, what, what was it like for us just even before we went into lockdown as we were running around yelling to people, warning people how serious this was going to be, yeah, we, how uh, their lives were going to change? Kind of take us through that. We were essentially chicken little. Uh, we had, we lined up a number of churches because uh, that was the easiest way to reach folks. And we warned them that something is coming and it is very bad. Uh, it's nothing to take lightly. It's worse than the flu. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something that we've never seen before uh, in our lifetimes. Um, we, I, I can't even remember the number of events that we did, but uh, it was starting to get, I wouldn't say we'd start to reach resistance, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't as well received at first. Um, people kind of halfway believed what we were doing and that things were coming, and we just had to keep beating the drum. Uh, and then uh, we started and moved into radio interviews. Remember Wild Wayne? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Interviews. Hold on, Eric, Eric. Before you get into that, I, here's a topic that I think would be interesting to reflect on. Like looking back now, a lot of what we are doing is fighting misinformation and disinformation oh, and yeah. looking, looking back on it now with the podcast and everything that we do daily. But before we even get to that, why don't you comment a bit on the early red flags that you looking back now, you know, the hairdryer, the Listerine, you know, oh, all gosh. of the, all the oh. different things that now were, were red flags that, that, uh, that misinformation and disinformation was so going to be one, one, a, a thing. One of the Cardinals, of course, you know, he, Mark Allen's referring to the people saying that you can kill COVID. First of all, they said that, uh, uh, COVID couldn't survive the heat. Uh, then they said that, uh, UV light works and there were suggestions that people can get UV light and put it in their bloodstream somehow. People literally were taking blow dryers and putting it up their nose, thinking they would be able to burn it out. Um, and these are very intelligent people uh, that just knew that they had the answer. People wanting to ingest bleach. People wanting to inject bleach. People lie so on, so on and spraying everything down from, I mean, I want to use his mouthwash. You name it, we saw it and we heard it. One in, of the the early, in the early days. In the early days. One of the most damaging to to the minority community in here in Louisiana was there was a myth that COVID-19 did not infect black people uh, because they were like, look at the stats in Africa that nobody in Africa has it. So 
So we're good. And that being good ended up in April with our governor being the first to, to, to report that seven out of 10 bodies at the time that showed up that had died from COVID-19 looked like me. Um, it was a harmful myth amongst all of the other ones that just perpetuated. There was a time at one point that we were in the middle of a campaign. We couldn't get the facts out because what we were worried about fighting the myth, there was so much mis and disinformation that we were spending all of our time really trying to keep up with it so we could dispel it. And we really had to make and intentionally turn our focus to the new facts and new developments to help, help, help fortify the truth. And let me just tell you, when, when you, when you start empowering people to create their own theories, conspiracies and information, it's a fight everywhere you go. Absolutely. And, and noise filter actually came about from a happy accident. We were, we were scheduled, uh, we were, we were scheduled to do a talk. There was a misunderstanding. And finally at that point I was like, Eric, we don't, we don't need to keep driving all over the different parishes surrounding uh, Orleans Parish. Let's create a podcast and let's let's you and I be central and get the information out that way. And yep. now, flash forward, you know, eighteen months later, we have a, a podcast that has daily listenership of anywhere between sixty to eighty thousand people uh, because it's now been picked up uh, by the Pacifica Network. Uh, which is now transmitted throughout the United States. It's a 10-minute daily podcast that focuses on COVID and now other public health issues from a, a, a social, economic, environmental, and racial justice lens. And that was a really important part. And, and that was a large part of kind of what led to the animations because we were so focused on trying to you know, do the thing that we usually do, which is take complicated things and explain it easy. So taking something like a pandemic, taking a virus, talk, talking about the r not, talking about flattening the curve, talking about things that people otherwise had never really heard or talked about. And for the first time, not only explaining it on a regular basis like we do on our radio program and, and, and our, you know, we developed a, a daily streamcast as well, but the podcast uh, as well. And the noise filter started to become its own. It started to take its own life to a certain degree because more and more people were relying on it. And I know that a lot of people, uh, Eric, would come up to you on a regular basis and say that the information they were getting from COVID was solid information because it was coming from us. Yep. They're still, they actually, people still come up to this day. I mean, now, I mean, currently, thank you. Hey, keep, keep going. You guys keep going. Uh, we, we're still on the radio. Uh, we're still on the podcast. We still, but let me just tell you, this has been in all the years. So 25, this is my 25 year anniversary, 25 year graduation from med school. Um, in all these years of being a doctor, I never, we, we never saw this coming. Never saw something like this. This coming. I mean, it, COVID exposed all the inequities in society, um, in because of the political environment, it emboldened a lot of people to speak up. And the thing is, a lot of times it was the wrong people because they were speaking loudly, but they were saying the wrong things. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think in the pandemic, it's shown that everyone thinks that they're an expert now. You know? Oh yeah, people that oh, have yeah. never had any interest or education in public health is now an expert because they watch this video. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. It's, it's shown the importance of a platform like noise filter, which has actual experts at the forefront using evidence-based uh, facts just to, and, and, and uh, news and updates and being able to comment on what's going on in the pandemic. Cause that's a yeah. really important resource. You know, yeah. I, I think the thing that people take for granted is how much work actually goes into noise filter, how much work actually goes into the dissemination of the correct information. We, when I say we go at every Mark Allen, I mean, Mark, Mark Allen sees patients. Mark Allen, we've, we've done, I mean, the cartoons are just, they're another, they're, they're a tool. We'll get to tool. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, no, no, I, I really want to give kudos where kudos are that at the very beginning went from the testing scared, not knowing whether or not you would contract the virus yourself or what it was, being out there in the hazmat suit, standing in the parking lot with the National Guard to battling and arguing with and talking, literally arguing with 
people at radio stations that were really trying to push conspiracy theories, um, arguing with the general public to even in the midst of the surge, folks, I got to give props where props is due. Um, uh, Mark Allen, Dr. Derry went when Ebola virus came out, he went and went to the mouth of the beast and faced it head on. Uh, the same thing happened here, here recently with the Delta virus. Part of the reason that we had this, we literally have had to slow things down because um, he went and he did six weeks in the intensive care, the ICUs. Um, and, you know, every day I talk to about a million people a day uh, on COVID since this whole thing, since March 13th, 2020, literally a million people about COVID, the new stuff, the old stuff. We have to read everything that's out there. We have to read all the bad data, all the good data, and then go over it with amongst the three of us and be like, is this true? What is this? The whole not like this has been, this is definitely more than a lot of people would think. People say they've done their research with their phone while they're in the bathroom. Yeah, we are living this. <laughs> we're, we're living it. <laughs> research. I, you know, I loved I loved all of the um, the memes that went out that like, you know, oh, you you read your first New England Journal article. Now you're uh, an infectious diseases doctor <laughs> and stuff, which I thought was it was really funny. This goes back to what, what David was saying. So so Doc Griggs and I were kind of in this battle uh, fighting misinformation. We had no idea how big and how bad it was going to be because what we now know is that misinformation travels through the uh, infosphere at six times the rate of, of real information. That's largely due to the fact that the headlines are clickbaity, they're sexy, um, they're never behind a paywall, whereas real science is always, not always, but oftentimes held behind a paywall. The best newspapers that were kind of bringing information to lay people were New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, LA Times are all behind paywalls. And of course, a large amount of the scientific publications are held behind paywalls. And on top of that, you need a certain level of education and understanding and experience in reading those articles to know how to interpret them. And so, you know, we can see looking back in retrospect how misinformation really has played a huge role in the pandemic. And I think that there's been a pandemic of misinformation uh, uh, as well. But what Time out. health literacy moment? Folks, use the term paywall. He means that they'll give you three sentences, and if you want to read the rest, you have to sign up for a year's worth at four ninety nine a month. Paywall. It's a you have to pay in order to get behind the wall to read it. Yeah. That's right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's like a toll. It's the equivalent yeah. of a toll. <laughs> but um, all right. So, for a toll. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, now David and I have been friends for many years. Uh, David and I actually grew up in the same part of the world, interestingly enough, and not only in Los Angeles, but in the same community uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and so although David and I are separated by a decade plus, really two decades, but who's counting? Um, David moved to New Orleans and, and, uh, and we ended up doing radio together uh, as well. And we actually ended up serving on the board of the radio station that I founded, WHIV. Uh, and, uh, and during the pandemic, uh, David, um, I think you moved back to Los Angeles officially in at the beginning of the year, but you were kind of going back and forth, right? During the yeah, pandemic. I, was, I was bouncing back and forth. I think at that time that we were talking around kind of this next iteration of noise filter, I was in LA at that time visiting family and I was just leaving. I was, I was producing and, and, uh, filming short videos for Tulane University around public health and a lot of stuff around COVID, information, education. And I was leaving to move back to LA. I was thinking about kind of the next step in my own career of health communications, health education, and wanting to do creative, really out of the box stuff, whether that was with animation or puppetry or, or other videos or mediums and how to, how to do something really different in health education, needing a boost. And that's where this conversation between you and I, Mark Allen, started around doing animations. Uh, right. Da David was really good with uh, like having Zoom happy hours uh, and catching up. And so um, I remember I was uh, in my office at the CAC and you and I were having a Zoom kind of happy hour and we were just kind of catching up. And I remember asking you if you understood. So this was in October of 2020. And I asked you, so a, a little bit more than a year ago, and I asked you, hey, do you understand how this mRNA vaccine works? And yeah, like, I, said, I said, no, but I know that it's going to be the next big wave, but I don't understand the science. 
Right. And I remember trying to explain it to you and I could see you were like, you were like following, but you know, MRNA to somebody who's never really understood MRNA ribosomes, stimulating antibodies, like all of these things. I just could see you're a scientifically educated person. You have a master's in public health. You understand these things. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, I'm like, God, wouldn't it be great if I could explain to you how this, this vaccine works in an animation? And then of course that would like, ping, like if we could animate two light bulbs, one day maybe we'll animate that process sure. and we can animate the process of two <laughs> light bulbs going off over our heads. And at that point, I think you and I saw the vision of holy smokes, Doc Griggs and I, and I think and we were actually talking about today uh, earlier this morning that um, I had always had a dream of animating myself into the size of a human cell and going inside the human cell. Uh, because when I was a little boy, I saw that being animated. Those were the animations I was watching at the time. Those were some movies that were available at the time where they were showing people being shrunk down and inside a cell. And I'm like, well, I want to be inside of a cell. And I remember calling Eric. I'm like, hey, dude, you want to do a cartoon where we shrink ourselves and we're inside a cell explaining how the mRNA vaccine <laughs> works? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't hesitate on that one. <laughs> how quick how quick were you like uh yes. yeah <laughs> i'm like this could be the next iteration of noise filter and uh you were like all right let's let's do it so at that point i was very lucky because some of my hiv grants i'm a typically i'm an hiv doctor and uh it had been converted to covid monies so we were able to um kind of flip some of those COVID monies, uh, some of those HIV monies and flip them over into COVID use. So the first, uh, so I'm going to throw this one to you, David. So the first video that we did was explaining the mRNA vaccine. So let's talk about some of the, what what, what happened there and, and kind of what was some of the story there? So yeah, it was, it's really breaking down and I could show more of it if you'd like, but it's really breaking down how the body uh, how how mRNA produces antibodies and that whole process. So uh, really taking the framework of a podcast, starting with these two doctors in the podcast podcast booth, then going inside the body and following along that process uh, and to how antibodies fight coronaviruses. So right. um, and the, they're the heroes, right? So. Um, and what did we want the heroes to look like? They they ended They're up looking kind what? of like a uh, like Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the heroes are Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> and then good. and then what about the virus? And the virus looks like Sid Vicious. He's a punk rocker. He's a bad boy, <laughs> uh, dressed in leather, and he's got the choker. And you know, he's got the spike choker on the spike protein. You know, you don't want you don't want him coming into your house or your nightclub <laughs> or whatever, may causing a ruckus. So you gotta have a good security system. <laughs> so. Um, and so that was a uh, um, so that the first video really was us trying to explain how the uh, the actual uh, uh, the and the the vaccine works, the mRNA vaccines. We got down to the cellular level. We tried to show in animated form how easy these vaccines work um, and then how they stimulate the immune system. So, Doc Griggs, then we went to uh, video number two, which has actually bears your name uh, in video number two, in which we then started talking about booster vaccines and variants, which was very prescient on our point. I think we wrote that that script when you said in, in April, David, is when we wrote that script and in and, and six months later, the things that we wrote about actually kind of came true. So Doc Griggs, that one was called, uh, what was it? The val Valiant Variants no. and the Three Little Griggs? No, no, the Big Bad Variant and the Three Little Griggs. Right, the Big Bad Variant and the Three Little Griggs. Big Doc Griggs, explain, Griggs, explain to us the Big Bad Variant and the Three Little Griggs. So the Big Bad Variant and the Three Little Griggs is on the premise of uh, the Big Bad Wolf, Three Little Pigs and the Big Bad Wolf. Uh, and how the COVID will mutate to get into the houses, the different house, whatever it takes. And it shows the different disguises. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty fun. 
pretty fun. Why don't I? Why don't I pull it up? Why don't I pull, yeah, it, up? pull it up? You can watch, you can watch uh, this bit. Uh, how he uses fairy tales to explain uh, code variants. So yeah. here we go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just pull it up. Give me one sec. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Yep. Yep. Watch and learn. <laughs> Imagine your body is like a house and COVID-19 is trying to break in. Antibodies created from vaccines are like your security system, recognizing the intruder and destroying it. But viruses are smart and they mutate, putting on new disguises to bypass your security system. Even if you're vaccinated, COVID-19 variants will emerge and transmit, and your antibodies will have trouble recognizing them. That's why we need a booster shot. mRNA vaccines help your immune system recognize COVID-19. When the virus mutates, the booster shot provides updated antibodies specifically designed to fight these new variants. Basically, we need to update our security system to keep out these new nasty neighbors. That's a wrap on today's episode. Ready to roll? Dude, please, no, 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 please don't. No! We mix the fairy tales up a little bit there, uh, don't we? Uh, and then the, the three little Griggs are me, uh, Doc Griggs, and then, of course, the little pig that was with us yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, again, we're having fun, right? What are we doing there? Like, we're, you know, way, way, way before people were talking about variants and booster shots, we created an animation that explained it all uh, in a fun clever at least i think they're fun and i think they're clever i don't know what, what you well, that's been the feedback that. we've been getting from adults in the six-year-olds seven-year-olds four-year-olds ten-year-olds uh, they they seem to enjoy them yeah i think that kind of goes to show what sort of messaging works you know that cartoons you know is something that multiple gen every generation kind of grew up watching some form of cartoons right and it's still like animation there's adult animations there's something about it that's really engaging and we're drawn to it. So if we can teach around health topics like vaccines or variants or different medications through something that's whimsical, exciting, creative, colorful, uh, stimulating, then you know we can hook audiences and get people thinking about things that they otherwise wouldn't or would have trouble understanding. And I think one of the things that we should probably make clear is that we don't do the animating. So right. we need to be clear about that. It's our voices that are on the animations, but we work with a group out of Boston called Fable Vision, excuse me, Fable Vision, and they do the animations. And so I was going to ask you guys, before we move into the HIV ones, for me, the the and I, we'll definitely go around the circle. We'll start with me, and then we'll go to you, Doc Griggs, after that. For me, the thing that I learned the most doing those two animations um, was how much you don't need to say that in animation it can show for you. In other words, there's a lot of visual cues that happen as a result of, of animation that we've never worked in animation before, right? The three of us were completely newcomers, mm -hmm. but now we're on our ninth video. We'll get to that in a second. And now we know how much script and dialogue we can do versus what can be shown uh, in the backdrop. So for me, that was, I think, an important lesson uh, because we've always worked in the, the real world, if you will, where if you're going to say something, you need to show something. And now we know that there's we can say less and let the animation say more and, uh, and, and less is more oftentimes because people can see it or they can hear it. And I think that that message gets across. So what your, your, your thoughts before we move on to the HIV, uh, doc Riggs. Well, well uh, I was going to let David, I thought, okay, I'll go. Um, you know, it's one of the things that you said is what I've learned is that the world of cartoons and animation, and I'm a big cartoon animation fan as you guys have come to learn um, is that anything is possible and it's not just a, 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 a bimodal experience uh, between a teacher or a lecturer and an audience. It's an experience. It's fully experiential. There's a term in pedagogy called multimodal. It, it allows you to pe for people to not only see it, not only hear it, but actually feel it uh, with the cartoons because you cycle with and like in some of the other animations and things happen, uh, won't give anything away, but like if something should happen to Dr. Dare, you feel it and you automatically, there's an empathetic empathetic draw to it that allows the messaging um, to stick a lot 
a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot better than it would than the traditional student, teacher, lecturer, audience format, because you can remember the emotion and it allows you to do that. I mean, that some of the kids, you watch them move and they're ready to fight when the antibodies come out. You can see them like, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a very powerful tool uh, that I think has been lost in the shuffle of this new age of multimedia fast and social media. Like this is, and it's fun. I mean, it's fun for everybody. It's fun for us. It's fun for the people watching. It's fun for the animators. Like it's fun. I think yeah, that's, absolutely. I think, yeah, that's what I learned. Yeah. And I think you know, piggybacking off of that, that empathetic component of it, of you know, you're really feeling these characters really uh, gravitating towards these characters. I just want to show you uh, a picture of the, uh, the antibodies here, if you can see them. These are the heroes, right? right? And when you just talk about antibodies verbally, you know, on a podcast or with your friends, it's really hard to understand what that looks like. But if you can take this character in your uh, in your mind, and another important point is just like here's the antibody grabbing onto the coronavirus, and when this part attaches to this part, then you get you, you're able to beat the coronavirus. Just showing that I think is something that you can't do through a podcast so well. So when you com combine both you really open up another door of, of education. And Dave, hold it there for a second. But th this gives me a great point of what I was saying was, look at the the look on the, the, the virus's face. It's scared yeah. when it sees the antibody. There's no way you will ever be able to communicate that through anything else but animation. And then and scroll forward one second when when she throws it and then you see the bam look at that like and look at the look yeah look at that. it's so cool that is stuff that you would never be able to see and then and then he, uh, go to the part where it's where, that right there right there hold it right there this yeah. is my favorite part and this is my zoom background is you can see doc griggs and i bumping elbows with the antibodies and then you can see the hearts emanating from me and doc griggs and these are things that I think are just are these subtle nuances, but they just say, I think they just say so much. And I think that they're they're just they're, they're, these are things that you can only do in animations. I just think that are so important to to to, to recognize. Yeah, as like you have storytelling of good guys and bad guys. That's a, a common thing throughout time, right? And so here are your good guys, right? right. These are the doctors with the antibodies fighting disinformation and fighting COVID, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And so that, you know, as opposed to this evil guy right here. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's uh it's a it's an amazing tool. Right. Uh, just like vaccines are, you know, whether it's animation or vaccines, like this is a way that we can get out and move move on out of this. And, and here's a little bit more uh, behind baseball here was that this scene in particular was at the very, very beginning, Doc Griggs and I had asked them if they could do like a Indiana Jones, like where the ball comes in the very beginning of the first Indiana Jones, when he swipes the statue and the right. ball comes rolling down uh, in the tunnel and he's running this, this was, uh, we asked them to do something like that. And this is what they, uh, so you could see the ball here. The virus is, is mm -hmm. chasing after doc Griggs and I, but the antibodies are there to save the day. Right. So, um, so yeah. So, so now I'm an, I'm an HIV doctor. We'd done these two animations and we thought, okay, well, that was fun. Hopefully the world will see them and, and we'll educate for them and what have you. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, there's we really love those COVID vaccines. Do you guys want to do three more animations on HIV? To which, of course, the three of us were like, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the three topics that we chose in HIV were the three that were the most obvious kind of low hanging fruit, which was we, U equals U. The idea that somebody who's living with HIV, um, and who's, uh, whose viral load is undetectable, does not transmit HIV to their intimate partner. So that means people living with HIV can have condomless intercourse uh, with their partners uh, who are not on PrEP or who are not on protection themselves, and there's zero percent chance of transmitting HIV. The second one that we did was PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and this is this notion that somebody who is on um, uh, PrEP does not, uh, who is HIV uh, negative, 
they take a medication that prevents HIV from uh, uh, from actually taking hold if they're exposed to HIV, uh, which and then which is more like birth control. Uh, so you take it in ahead of time and it, it uh, prevents an exposure later. And then the third video that we did was NPEP. And NPEP was, uh, is the idea that if there's an HIV exposure, just like you have plan B or emergency contraception, you have an exposure and then you take contraception the next day. It's the same thing, uh, with, with NPEP is that we were able, uh, to create an animation that looked at NPEP. So those were the three topics and, and Doc Griggs, I'll, I'll toss to you real quickly. We wanted to do something different. We didn't want two doctors talking to each other, talking about HIV. Uh, we wanted to lift up the voice of, of people living with HIV. So what was the decision that we made? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. So one of the things that we realized is that in following the same model, in order to, to really affect the community, you need to include the community. And in, you know, in the real world of pre-COVID, we're just two doctors that happen to be a bunch of science geeks and nerds uh, that talk in big words that nobody understands. But if we create champions and we recognize the champions within those communities, people actually take the message and they can roll with it. And it's the correct information. So uh, Milan Nicole Cherie, uh, a famous uh, person here in the city um, who, 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 I guess, yeah, we met through Mark Allen. You, you knew you knew her. Right, right, right. She's a Milan Nicole Shree is a person of trans experience uh, who is a person living with HIV. So we very well known, very influential, very New activist. Orleans. Yeah. She's an activist. She actually coined the the hashtag, which is very uh, uh, with trends regularly, which is Black Trans Lives Matter, is the hashtag that she coined. And what we wanted to do is really elevate the voices of people of trans experience. At the time that we were writing the scripts and we were thinking about the scripts, was right around the same time that we saw state houses throughout the South were uh, uh, creating these anti trans laws and were picking on trans teenagers, particularly uh, to solving a problem that didn't exist. They were trying to, and if it did exist, it happened in a very minimal amount of times, but people who are trans experienced that were athletes and they were tr trying to ban these individuals. And all it was, was really, um, it, it was a continued, uh, and, and long history of, of hate and discrimination and stigma that uh, for people that belong in the LGBTQ community, especially in, in the state houses in the South. So we really found that it was really important for us to elevate the voices of people of trans experience. And, and so Dave, David, we ended up um, kind of, you know, create, you know, reaching out to Milan Nicole Cherie, and we asked her the same question. Um, so, Milan, how do you feel about being animated and talking to two doctors and going inside our bodies uh, to do uh, uh, to explain HIV? So, what, walk us through kind of what the the general uh, consensus was for each of the three videos and what we did, and we'll kind of explain them a little bit in detail. Yeah, and. You know, I think as uh, Doc Riggs was talking about championing these voices, you know, we were saying, how would, Milan, how would you tell this story, right? You know, um, for these other videos, we've gone inside the human body, the general human body to explain mRNA vaccines. She said, well, why don't we go inside of my body and explain uh, U equals U inside of my body and HIV? So do you feel comfortable doing that? you know, and sharing your status with the world and going through it. And she said, yeah, of course. So that was a really interesting, um, you know, way to tell her story and uh, to talk about U equals U. And then also using metaphors, which I think is a, a key at the, it's a key component of what we're doing. Kind of like how we were using Big Bad Wolf to explain variants. Uh, in this one, we're using an orchestra to explain uh, U equals U and how antibodies, CD4 cells, uh, and the HIV virus interact inside the body, but using music metaphors to explain it, using something creative, something different, something that people can gravitate to that's not purely scientific. Can we, do you have a snippet? I do. So why don't we, why don't we watch this? It starts off... Uh, I'm going to start off. This is Milan uh, talking to the doctors, um, introducing them into her body. And uh, since we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll go through this. It's really, this is one of my favorite videos we've done. So here we go. 
can can y'all see it okay? Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna blow this up here. HIV and people of trans experience are often misunderstood. Taking a peek inside my body will help explain it better. No mystery here. My body works just like yours and all y'all watching. Check out my CD4 cell. Don't they look good? Oh, fabulous. Wow. Mm, that looks great. CD4 cells produce antibodies that protect you from infection. Imagine your immune system is an orchestra and the CD4 cells are the conductors. Hold up. It didn't always look like this. Let's rewind. HIV targets and destroys CD4 cells, which reduces antibody production and immune protection. See here, my HIV viral load was high and my CD4 count was low. I got tested for HIV and started medication. Look, my HIV medication is working. My CD4 cells and antibodies are back and now my HIV viral load is down. Ta-da! With an undetectable viral load, I am now untransmittable. You equals you. I have zero chance of transmitting HIV to my intimate partner. People living with an undetectable HIV viral load can have the same life expectancy, quality, and enjoyment of life as people not living with HIV, including being intimate without fear of transmitting HIV. Hey now, that is none of your business. Increasing HIV testing, diagnosing, treating, and maintaining lifelong care can get us to an HIV-free world. Milan, there's no one better than you to talk about you equals you. Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, a couple things, at least with that one, that I just wanted to point out. One is that we wanted to make sure uh, that the tra- that the trans flag was everywhere. So when she makes her entrance and certainly the exit, um, the, the other thing that is that we, we had a hard time trying to create HIV. Remember, we didn't want to make it a, like a, like a bad virus, like, uh, like the coronavirus because people are, are living with HIV. So we had to, we chose to make it goofy looking. You know, and 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 that was the uh, and and you could see that the virus, and we ended up bringing that virus back. We had to bring it back three times, right? We brought yeah. it back for you equals you, and then for prep, which is the next video that we did. Again, uh, we used again the orchestra metaphor, and uh, again, and the idea being that when people are on prep. Um, after, uh, Milan asked Doc Griggs and I, she's like, I got to go inside one of your body. So who does it want to be? And Doc Griggs and I are, are, you know, pushing each other down. Me, 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 me. And so we end up going inside, uh, my body and, uh, uh, and you can see the CD4 cells look more like me, just like the CD4 cells. That was another point is. Yeah, yeah, the, that we made sure that we went into Milan's body, that the CD4 cells represented Milan in skin tone, in looks, the way that the, the CD4 cells present. Whereas when we get into my body, the CD4 cells uh, look a little bit more like me. They have little pompadours or mohawks kind of reflecting my my uh, the, the way I present myself. Uh, which is uh, a little bit more retro and I'm a skateboarder and listen to punk rock music and play in bands. And so we try to embody that. And what we did is we utilized the idea of a force field and that prep is that force field. And David, maybe you could just show us that real quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll pull it up right now. And um, yeah. And so, and, and, and again, something that you can do in animation, you know? And so, here is a little a little red blood cell who's on a skateboard because I skateboard, so they're uh, uh should I, should I play it or yeah, yeah, just play just play for a quick second. Okay, just- sure. Now check out your strong CD4 cell. They don't look that strong. CD4 cells are like an orchestra conductor directing the immune system to make antibodies. Oh ah, ah. looks like HIV is trying to break in. Well, it's a good thing you're on prep. Just like how birth control prevents pregnancy, taking a prep pill daily prevents you from getting HIV. Prep is like a force field. If HIV enters the body, it targets it and wipes it out. So then, then we then tackled NPEP, and uh, and I would say up to this point, we wrote all the scripts, and uh, and for NPEP, we we turned it over to Fable Vision because I think. I think it was just there was the combination of we were just getting to the beginning of Delta. 
I, I can't remember what the situation no, things was. Things cranked up. The, the, the things time, were the time. The bandwidth d definitely decreased as the surge hit. Right, and so we we turned it over uh, to Fable Vision, and they actually took a, a leading hand in writing the script. And the script they wrote was brilliant. I, there's no way that we would have ever landed on it. They took a completely different approach, and maybe you could just play a few minutes of of. The, um, I love yeah, that. And just to and just to introduce uh, this video a bit more. You know, uh, along with this sense of metaphors using orchestras and music to explain U equals U in prep or fairy tales to to introduce variants. These we're trying to always think about creative ways to explain difficult topics, right? So most people have never heard of non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. Right, but how can we do it in some in a way that something they might have heard? So we use the metaphor of Little Miss Muffet, which is Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Along came the spider and sat sat down beside her and scared Miss Muffet away. So uh, just with that in so, mind, this yes, is so, where, so how did so how did we turn that into NPEP? Right, like, how do you take that and to describe <laughs> HIV medication? It's a bit of a leap, but it As works. As Doc Briggs would say, watch and learn. Rush and you know, watch and learn. <laughs> okay, so here's where Milan enters the studio. Milan Nicole Cherie on a tuffet? Mm hmm. Watch and learn, boys. NPEP is a super important tool for managing HIV. This medication prevents people from contracting HIV after HIV exposure. M M Milan, there's a weird virusy looking spider right up. That's HIV. It's been 48 hours since an HIV exposure, and it's looking for a way to start replicating and establishing an infection. Look, if we don't do something soon, the HIV virus can multiply and go from this to this. Uh, may I? No way. That's why, in a case like this, NPEP is essential for blocking HIV from replicating. Taking NPEP within 72 hours of a possible HIV exposure can prevent an HIV infection. Thanks, Miss Muffet. I'm the queen of New Orleans babies, and that's Miss Muffalata to you. <laughs> I still, I still smile at, at, at all of them. Uh, and another little behind baseball uh, note is that they made the NPEP look like a little Truvada pill which used to be one of the uh, NPEP um, uh, combinations. We've gotten a little bit better with what we use, but NPEP, that, that little pill, the character looked like a little Truvada pill. So, so then we made the leap to now working within clinical trials. And uh, Eric, do you want to talk about how, uh, how that one came about and how we end up getting a Grammy awarded, a Grammy award uh, singer uh, to join us and, and well, what the, same principle as before. Uh, what COVID did was it just pulled back the Band-Aid on these festering wounds of health and equity uh, across the board. Uh, we got reached out to, I don't know, can we say the school? One of the schools reached out to us because they wanted to recruit more minorities into clinical trials. There was a lot of myths and distrust. Um, and there were a lot of things that weren't talked about. Uh, the Tuskegee experiment being one of them, uh, in particular, the large one. Um, and that's really a large part of the reason, uh, Mark Allen, you went to Portugal. There was a lot of trust in government and healthcare, and that didn't doesn't exist here, uh, and it needs to be addressed. And we figured that by taking the same approach and using a community champion to guide us, the two doctors, through the process, deal with the elephant in the room. Um, hopefully, we can make a make a difference in the conversation. And that's I'm kind of giving it away without giving it away. Um, how else would you describe it? Yeah, no, 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 no. I, yeah, I, I, what we did, and Dave, can we show some of it? Or are um, we I think maybe we could show a few stills from it. I don't. I, it's not finished yet, and okay. uh, how much we, we yeah, and and it's yeah. public. It's public because we put a press release out, so it is public. Right. So, so me, here, essentially, yeah, here's yeah. A, you know, this is Irma Thomas with the doctors. Uh, Irma Thomas. Grammy award-winning Miss Irma. That's yeah, right. the soul, soul queen of New Orleans. Yeah. Right? And so, again, what this animation can do is tackle a pretty dense topic like clinical trials. A lot of 
people don't understand the process of clinical trials and how it moves from phase one to two to three to four. Uh, and we do that through music. Uh, Doc Griggs uh, does a Hamilton rap explaining. Uh, uh, in two takes. In, in two, two takes. takes. <laughs> amazing. In and two takes. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And then we also. With, with Irma Thomas sitting right to the right of them, just watching him. Talk about pressure. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, Irma, there's Irma Thomas Irma watching Thomas. him. Um, and he, in two takes, one of the world's famous singers, Eric just got up to the microphone, read the <laughs> script, and, and did a rap uh, and sang the, sang the lyrics. It was uh, just really, to this day, it's the thing that stuns me the most. I got up there afterwards, and I had one line to do, and I think I had to repeat it 14 times. Eric did his. That was one the, line the, I had to sing. <laughs> like Mark, Mark Allen would say, behind baseball, uh, the, the, he and he nailed it, right? He did it. It took a couple of takes, but he nailed it. But in the early productions of it, they they missed the beat. I'm like, <laughs> he was like, "Did I miss that? No, you nailed it. You, you put all that work into it, and it came out off beat. It was hilarious." Um, so, so the, just to be clear, what we did is we really wanted to. The idea was because of Tuskegee and other structural discrimination that we've seen not only in society but in sciences in particular in medicine how do we increase how do we increase the level of clinical trials um, specifically uh, amongst uh, communities of color and so we reached out to the, the what I think is one of the most prominent voices uh, certainly uh, in, in in the black community an elder uh, spokeswoman, for whom people trust and for whom uh, uh, people uh, recognize as being somebody in the South and representing New Orleans. And when I first reached out to Miss Irma to talk with her about it, do you remember uh, the, the nail biting day? It took her eight days, eight days to get back with us because and she, when I went to go first meet her, she's like, I want you to come meet me before she wanted to see who we were like, yes, she knew Doc Griggs because Doc Griggs is on the news every day. She had looked me up and saw that, yes, I was a legit doctor. I wasn't some guy randomly calling her out of the blue. And she'd seen the animations with the vaccines. But her issue was, you know, and, and to kind of paraphrase the conversation we had was, you're talking about centuries of discrimination. And I wanted to, I, I needed to think about was something that I was going to do in three or four minutes, would that be impactful against centuries of discrimination that existed? And her answer to me was finally, and we quoted her in the animation, which was, the reason why I did it is that I, if I could do anything so that my grandchildren have the right medications um, and so that they can be treated appropriately uh, in their illnesses that they will eventually come to have, then if I have a, uh, a potentially positive aspect in that, then, then this is really why I'm doing it. And that was really an impactful part of the, um, of, of the animation. And this is the animation. I mean, we always say it for each one of them that this is the one that we're most proud of, but this is the one that we're most proud of, or at least speaking for myself. Because what we've done here in this animation is that we've addressed the so-called elephant in the room that both Dave and Eric were talking about. And that elephant in the room is something that medicine is just now starting to grapple with. And that is the inherent structural racism and discrimination that occurs within the field of which um, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, Henrietta Lacks, what have you, you know, embody. And we saw it as a result of uh, communities of color who initially, and to a certain degree, maybe still, but certainly initially refused to take the COVID vaccine because of drawing on those previous experiences. Like Eric said, Eric said there's a lack of trust uh, in government. So any any thoughts before we move on, guys, uh, uh, just quickly to the other next set of videos? No, you set, you, you kind of set that up. That one, you put a button in it until they can see it. That was a good one. Yeah. 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 We're, I mean, all I just want to say is that, you know, it's a, like all of these videos, they're really important tools for educating about things that are really hard to address. You know, like you're not going to normally see uh, an institution of medicine take accountability through the form of animation for yes. years of, yes. Yes. of yes. discrimination. And so here's, again, a great way to tell that story 
and to use it as a way to make the future better, right? Yes. It's like, we, we need to all be, uh, you know, we can all participate in clinical trials in a way to advance society. And if we can share that message in a way that is engaging and fun and interesting, then why not? And I think just, you know, to, uh, to that point, I think what Noise Filter is doing through these animations is really finding really uh, creative ways to tackle stuff that no people normally wouldn't. And that's why it's important. And there's no limit of topics, health topics, or maybe racial topics uh, to, to discuss. Um, whether it's more health focused about how different organs work or how blindness works or more, um, or, or racial discrimination in, in medicine. You know, there's, there's really no limit. And that's what I love about this project. Yeah, and so this leads us to the the next video because we thought, okay, well, some of these videos have been very long and we've shit long, two and a half minutes, three minutes, right? So <laughs> we're like, can we do something in a minute? Let's challenge ourselves because now we had gotten used to, um, we had gotten used to um, making these videos. Remember the first couple of videos, we were wow. like, we didn't know what we were doing. and But now we understood the visualization. And so we were like, can we do something in one minute? And so this was our next challenge. And so we looked at hepatitis C because really hepatitis C can be talked about in such a short period of time because we know that if you test for hepatitis C and if you can treat for hepatitis C and ultimately you cure for hepatitis C, preventing potentially um, uh, liver cancer. And so we did it. Now at the time that this video was being written, I was supposed to go to, the, to, go to England London as part of my, like, I've been working so hard for the last 16 months or whatever. And I was going to go see, my wife and I were going to go see one of our favorite bands uh, in England. And uh, they were called the Specials. And they're part of what's called the Two-Tone Ska Movement, which was a movement in the in the 70s where it was a very anti-racist movement uh, because in, at that time in the 70s, there was a lot of uh, a nationalism in, 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 in England and what have you. And so folks that wore a black and white pattern uh, identified them as being very anti-racist. And so we decided that we were going to kind of revive that look and that theme and that mode. Um, and that was what got us to this video uh, that we're going to, do you have queued up that we can yeah, show? Yeah, I have a queued up. I'll just say that this is, uh, it's still a working draft. We're almost done with it. It should be out next week. Um, and you can check it out here. Again, one minute PSA around hepatitis C, unlike anything you've probably ever seen before in a hepatitis C video. So here we go. Uh, again, it is a work in progress, so bear with us. So good is your liver Looks like a football gone flat It filters toxins, cleans your blood Metabolize is bad Just reach out I need a healthy liver, yeah, it's vital for survival That's why we only talk about the liver's biggest rival The virus, hepatitis C Never see a checks the liver that can lead to cancer But do not fear this virus, here cause there's a straight up answer You gotta test simple blood test does a trick Good luck getting that earworm out of your uh, out of your brain yeah. for the next ten hours, uh, yeah. Doc Riggs. We're we're kind of running up to the against the hour. Can you talk to us through the next two videos, our final two videos, and so how they came about and what we're trying to do? Yeah, we have a lot of fans, and the 100 Black Men of Organization, of which I'm a member, it's a national organization mentoring Black males. It's been around since the 60s. Uh, thousands and thousands of members. Um, they enjoyed everything that we did. Uh, the, the, believe it or not, the researching scientists and big wigs at Pfizer saw what we were doing and as did the national COVID resiliency network, 
So they wanted to talk to us about uh, doing videos uh, regarding pediatric vaccines and masking. And we uh, talked to a colleague of ours, Dr. Corey Abair, who's a pediatrician, who has an adorable daughter. Um, there's a song, it's our noise filter bop, um, that, we're, that, we're, that we're working on um, to talk about masking and making, again, making the community the superheroes, letting them know that we're, we're there. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is masking, much along the same lines. I mean, this is all really exciting. And then there, we have two more in the hopper uh, to be deter- topics to be determined after that. I mean, who'd have thought we'd be able to live in the world of cartoons, which is amazing <laughs> and fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these are super, super works in progress. I don't think we we can't show anything, right? No, no, no not yet. But, you know, it, the, as we are starting to move into pediatric vaccines around COVID and as that's starting to be rolled out, not only are we trying to educate kids around vaccines, but also their parents and how, how can we address multiple age ranges uh, with these next videos, one about vaccines and another one on masking. And again, being able to show how masks work through animation is something that is really unique that we could do with these sort of, with these cartoons. And the first song that we have written is great, right? It's a, it's a kid song. It's like, this is the first, this is the first one that we did that this is a kid's video and it's a kid song. So we started off at mRNA vaccines geared for adults, but could be watched by kids. Went to the HIV ones that are a little bit more adult oriented, went to the, you know, the clinical trials, which is again, a little bit more adult oriented, but then we went to the music with the hep C, which is fun and anybody can watch it. And now we're stepping squarely into the space of, of children's animations and cartoons. So that's a lot of breadth and variety. And I will say a year ago, doc Griggs and I were still struggling to try to get on Facebook to do our videos. And now here we are, (laughs) here we are a year later, (laughs) a year later with zero vaccine options last year. Yes. Zero vaccine options. There were no vaccines. Right. So we really have come uh, and uh, a, a, a a long progress uh, 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 to, to get to where we are right now, long distance to get to where we are right now. And it's uh, largely due to the teamwork and the expertise that each one of us brings to the table. So, uh, Eric, of course, uh, you and I have been doing this for years and, and I can and, and I look forward to the next, you know, Three years ago, four years ago, when I first said, hey, let's do radio together, you know, and then I would have said, you and I are going to show up in animations together. And you would have been like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Sit down. Let's yeah. do radio. So, well, what's that? You know, there, you, there's so many possibilities of where this so can go. I'm going to bring it up publicly. It's, I'm going to bring it up publicly, David. So it's, it's, it's recorded in the annals forever. Mark Allen, our video game. We, I'm not <laughs> letting that go. I forgot about that. I'm not letting it go. <laughs> Noise filter video game. I forgot no, about that. We, 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 look, I'm, I'm there. Hey, hey just on top of that, the noise filter, the amusement park ride, you know, going <laughs> inside the body. We got t shirts. And we, we and have the, Oculus <laughs> AR, VR experiences. Why not? And we do have a, uh, uh, we do have a graphic novel that we are working yes. on as well. Uh, this is really, really early, but it's looking at uh, queer uh, adolescents and teaching sex ed uh, to LGBTQ plus uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders uh, that Doc Griggs and I are kind of gently walking young people through the process of understanding their body. That's also something that's probably about six months away from, from, from being able to do so. But in the interim, we're bumping up to the top of the hour here. Thank I'm you so sure. much. I just want to share this too. This is all our information right here. If you can see it, this is our website, noisefiltershow.com. If you want to see more, uh, if you want to watch these animations um, and learn more about Noise Filter, and also you can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook at Noise Filter Show. So write those down. And, and right. And Doc Riggs, them. where can they find you? You're at Doc Riggs One. I'm at Doc Riggs One on Instagram, uh, Eric Griggs. On Facebook, Doc Griggs on Facebook, Eric Griggs MD on um, LinkedIn. I'm also, believe it or not, on TikTok. You know, I don't know how to TikTok. The TikTokers and the K-poppers. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not cool kid yet. But I'm Doc Griggs one there too. 
And you can find me at the Dr. Derry. That's at the D R D E R Y uh, as well. And I, I tweet uh, mostly and do a little bit of Facebook. So more than anything else, thank you, Southern uh, AIDS uh, Coalition, uh, for allowing us this opportunity to talk about the things that are near and dear to our hearts. So thank you, everybody. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you.